It's half past eight. Half past eight. It's half past eight, New York time. Time to wake up America and stump the experts. Every week at this time, Lucky Strike stages a question and answer party. Here's how it goes. You finish the questions and our experts try to answer them. For every question used, Lucky Strike will reward you with $10 in defense stamps. If the question is muffed, you get a total of a $50 defense bond, plus a 24-volume set of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Send your questions to Information, Please, 480 Lexington Avenue, New York City. If our editori editorial staff edits your questions a bit, don't fret over it. In case of similarity, we'll have to be sole judge of who shall be paid. And all questions become the property of Information, Please. And now I'll up us Lucky Strike as I present our Master of Ceremonies book reviewer of the New Yorker magazine, Clifton Fadiman. Mr. Fadiman. Ladies and gentlemen, information, please, goes on as usual in its unpremeditated and unrehearsed path. Tonight, John Kieran and Franklin P. Adams are with us and as our special guests, Deems Taylor, composer and commentator, and Alexander Wolcott, author, raconteur, and critic. Now we're going to start with a question from John Jennings of New York. What event traditionally occurs at this hour? For example, if I said 11 a.m. once a year, well, what event would that bring to mind, Mr. Adams? Uh, Armistice Day. That's quite right. That, however, is just an example, Mr. Adams. You don't get any credit for that whatsoever. <clears throat> uh, what event uh, occurs at 7 a.m. Tuesday, traditionally? 7 a.m. Tuesday. Now, this might be once a year, perhaps. I'm not up then. <laughs> well, it occurs before you get up then, Mr. Taylor. It's a pre-Taylor event. Mr. Uh, Kieran? The opening of the polls on Election Day? That's quite right. Yes, the opening of the polls on Election Day. I wonder oh, how I many of our listeners thought of it. you the following Tuesday. Next Tuesday. <laughs> no, just, just a well, Tuesday. Do you have to say following Tuesday? No. <clears throat> how about 10 p.m. Friday? Any Friday. 10 p.m. some Fridays. Some This Friday. isn't necessarily once a year. Ten? Mr. Kieran? Oh, why, uh, heavyweight championship fights begin. That's right. And they're usually broadcast at that hour over the radio. And right? I take the 10 o'clock train home. <laughs> and you take the 10 o'clock train home, yes. How is that 10 o'clock train, by the way, Mr. Adam? Very good. Very good. Still getting at 11.23, they say. <laughs> uh, how about 12 noon Saturday? What would that mean to any of you? Uh, Mr. Kieran? The whistle blows. Uh, yes, though sometimes at one. Isn't that true? Not I don't where I work. <laughs> No, I, I think there'd be another answer to that. Uh, banks close at 12 noon on Saturday. Bank, you know what a bank is, Mr. Adams? Do you have any dealings at all yes, with banks sir, these days? Yes, where a wild time grows. That's the one. <laughs> yes, that's just the one of the wild times in which they close at 12 grows. noon. How about 2 a.m. Sunday? 2 a.m. Sunday. Uh, Mr. Taylor. Oh, uh, daylight saving goes into effect. Yes, and it will go into effect very shortly for the entire country. Yes. Well, we got about three that and three quarters That will be 2 a.m. Monday this time. That will be 2 a.m. Monday? Why yes, won't, sir. Uh, will I it don't be Monday? Know it's on a Monday this time. They're changing it? Ninth. That's so? Well, I'm very glad to get that announcement made clear to all our listeners. Now, how about this one from E.G. Davison of Belmont, Massachusetts? Again, get three out of four. It's about dinner parties that occurred uh, in plays that you may have seen or in movies that you may have seen. At what dinner party did the guests appear on the wrong night? The guests appeared on the wrong night. Mr. Adams. I think that was an English play. The Man from Blankley's. Now, there you have me. I never saw it. Does anyone know the man from Blankley's, Mr. Wilcott? I've forgotten it now. Uh, I wouldn't know. Uh, you may be quite right, Mr. Adams. The one I was thinking of was, you can't take it with you, where the uh, Kirby's, you remember the rich and respectable Kirby's, oh, yes. appear at the house of the humble but crazy. Why, but? Humble and crazy sycamores. Yeah. I thought any night would be wrong there. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, Mr. Wilcott. It might very well be. <laughs> I uh, might be wrong, and I think we'll have to count your question, your answer wrong, Mr. Adams, until we can look it up in the library. Now, how about this one? At what dinner party did the host refuse to sit down? Mr. Kieran. That was Macbeth who refused to sit down because there was a ghost sitting in his chair. That is right, yes. Uh, at what dinner party did the guests of honor fail to appear? Mr. Wilcox. Dinner at eight. At dinner at eight, yes. A party given for the... Fern Cliffs, it tells well, me. Well, uh, they called them wretched little cockneys when they didn't come. <laughs> <laughs> and in what, at what dinner party were the guests asked to decide the fate of two men? The guests were asked to decide between two men. Oh. Well, it's, um, it was recently made into a movie. Does that give you any hint at all? It's a play made uh, into a movie? I think it was. 
or at least uh, not into a movie, but recently given here, recently revived here. The Doctor's Dilemma. Do you remember, any oh, of you yeah. remember the Doctor, Mr. Wilcott, remember yes, that? Yes, yes, of course that's the one. Yes, yes, yes. that is the one. They which, which the Doctor had skill to save one patient, and which did he save? Yes, which did he save, by the way? Well, he one? voted to save the country practitioner instead of the artist. right yes. And, uh, wrong because, he huh? because and he was in love with the artist's wife. Yes, for the wrong reason. Now, see, me, we got two wrong on that, and that will send a $50 defense bond to Mr. Davis. How about this one from Philip S. Waters of White Plains, New York? Get two out of three. Now, this is a very tricky one, I think. I'm going to ask you to give me the well-known poem whose opening lines begin with these words. Now, I'll give you just the first words of the first four lines. The first line begins with you, the second with and your, the third with and yet you, and the fourth with do you. What poem is it? You, you, and you, your, and your, and yet you, do you. Sounds abusive. Uh, matter of fact, it's slightly abusive. <laughs> slightly abusive, Mr. Taylor, very slightly. Mr. Kieran? It sounds as though it came from uh, Alice in Wonderland. You're right, Mr. Kieran. How do you, uh, how do you know that? <clears throat> Our old father, old William. Yes. That's the one, yes. Your old father, William, the young man said, and your hair has become very white, and yet you incessantly stand on your head. Do you think at your age it is right? Yes. Now, that, that's a very tricky question. Now, here's another one, a similar problem. The first words of the four lines are, should, and, should, and. Mr. Wilcott. Uh, should a body k kiss a body coming through the ride? Uh, no, no. Is You've got the oh, first that's line. Again, isn't uh, it? That, that's uh, oh, right. coming would be the beginning of the second line. Oh, all right, that was very good. Should all acquaintance be forgot? Yes. Can you continue with it? And never brought to mind. Yes. How does it go on? This will slay you, Mr. Adams. Should old acquaintance be forgot? Yeah, no, that's <laughs> right. And the days of all Lang Syne. And all Lang Syne. Yes, all that's Lang. right. Uh, all Lang Syne. Burns is all Lang Syne. Now, I how about the right this country. One? Mm -hmm. uh, see if we can do better on this one. Mine, he, he, his. Mine, he, he, his. Mr. Wilcott? Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Yes, that's right. Uh, yeah. He is tramping, tramping out, out the vintage. Tramping out the vintage where the, the grapes of wrath are stored. Yeah. Yeah. Loose the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. Yes, Stop and if we myself. had uh, a half hour at our disposal, Mr. Wilcott, I'd love to have you explain to us just how that happened to be written. <laughs> yeah, I see. <laughs> that gives us two out of three. For, I don't mean for the battle. He did a broadcast on that once, too. <laughs> <laughs> once. <laughs> how about this? <laughs> this comes from Catherine Cashman of Milton, Massachusetts. Again, get two out of three. It's about banks. What characters, whether of fact or fiction, are associated with these banks? The first bank is the Northfield Bank. The Northfield Bank. It's the I only one I haven't got an account in. Uh, <laughs> it's one of the many, Mr. Taylor. It's, it's the scene of the robbery in Northfield, Minnesota, at which uh, Jesse James uh, officiated. Does that come back to you now, Mr. Adams? Famous uh, Northfield robbery. And how about the... How about Telson's Bank? Telson's Bank. Mr. Kieran. Mr. Jarvis Laurie in uh, Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. That's quite right. Exactly right. Uh, or Jerry Cruncher, his man, both associated right with Telson's Bank. The Brooklyn Trust Company. Brooklyn Trust Company. Does that bring anything to your mind, uh, Mr. Kieran? Yes, sir. Uh, held the mortgage on the Dodger Ball Club for quite a while. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, the <laughs> trusting and soft Brooklynites. Well, that was the, the uh, bank from uh, which Larry McPhail borrowed very That's heavily right. to finance the Dodgers and turned out all right, didn't it? Uh, paid him back, I Paid believe. him back, yes, every dollar. How about this one from uh, Ralph Lowy of New York City? In what play is a marriage saved because of the following, in the following way? In what play is a marriage saved because the wife's maternal feeling causes her to choose the weaker of the two men? Mr. Wilcott. Candida. Candida, yes. Sir George Bernard Shaw's Candida. Now, how about this one? The wife decides to fight like a tigress. It says here, like a tigress. I don't know why they always fight like a tigress for their husbands. The wife decides to fight for her husband in what play? Any other play. <laughs> in many plays, I should think. Only but, in a play. Uh, but I... <laughs> <laughs> There's a particular one I have in mind, gentlemen. It's Claire Booth's The Women, in which I think the... Uh, action turns on a wife deciding to was fight. Was that what Margot O'Gilmore was doing? I don't know whether it was Margot O'Gilmore who did the fighting. I've, I've forgotten how the cast worked out. Do you remember, Mr. Wilcott? It's a great surprise to me. I well, didn't know sorry, that's what it says here. 
Uh, the husband loses interest in the other woman because the wife arranges to have them see a good deal of each other. Oh, that's By the way, that's a fallacy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in this play, it works out. The uh, marriage is saved. Uh, that way, do you remember, any of you? Sounds like Bernard Shaw. No, it isn't, Mr. Karen. It's uh, Barry's What Every Woman Knows. Barry's What Every Woman Knows. Now, how about this one? The wife decides to give up her phony ideas of reform and be a real wife and mother. Oh, yeah. Uh, Mr. Kieran? Well, uh, one I'll take would be uh, Taming of the Shrew. Yeah, are there ideas of reform? In no, it's a play by Rachel Crothers. Yes, I should think that would be the answer. What one? Uh, Mr. Susan and God. Susan and God, Mr. Wilcott, and Mr. Taylor, thank you. With well, that, I think, loses a $50 defense bond to Mr. Ralph Lowy of the city, and a set of the Britannica goes with it, of course. The next one comes from C.L. Jones of East Orange, New Jersey. Now, gentlemen, you're going to listen to three different conversations. In connection with what field of activity would each of these conversations be overheard? In other words, each of them uses a special kind of language. Let's have the first. Hey, Hoople, how's the clock on that stone crusher of yours? It's the icebreaker. See you on a show break. What are these gentlemen talking about? Any guesses? Does it mean anything to you at all, Mr. Kieran? Might be a racing. No. It's not. See on the show break. Uh, see on the show break. Does not uh, recall anything. Wasn't that circus? No, no. I it, give up. No, uh, two, uh, two taxi drivers. Uh, the translation is, is very simple. A hoople is a driver on a 24-hour stretch, and he says, uh, what's the meter reading on that cab with a knocking motor? That stone crusher of yours. The other says, nothing. This is my first fare of the day, the icebreaker. See you on the show break. I'll see you when the theater's let out. It's as simple as ABC, isn't it, Mr. Wilcox? Yeah. <laughs> sure, nothing in the easy. Syrian. We'll just mark that wrong. Now let's have the second. That blind Tom ought to have a tin cup. He ain't giving us a corner all day. Yeah, and what's more, old Moses has been giving him this and that right along. Oh, that, Kieran, that's yeah. easy. A couple of ball players talking about a fine, upstanding, honest, efficient umpire. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard you talk that way about umpires, <coughs> Mr. Kieran. Not generally as warm as that. Yeah. Uh, what, what's the general idea of the conversation, Mr. Kieran? Why, well, yeah. they're complaining that the umpire isn't calling the strikes that uh, nick the corner of the plate. Yeah, uh, not giving you any breaks at all. And uh, how about this one? The third and last is the hardest, I think. This Mark is a Canadian. Remember all you sticks are Morgans and Whitney's. So extra parts and your end will be good for at least a C note. Supposing he sings. He wouldn't sing. The girls are looking for him back home. Uh, Mr. Wilcott? Well, I think it's uh, criminal. <laughs> oh, highly. highly <laughs> yes. And how take you the kind? The hold up. Not now, precisely, uh, Mr. Uh, Adams. counterfeiting. Well, it might, it might be uh, counterfeiting. What makes you think that? What makes you think it's counterfeiting? I think it's confidence. Man. Yes, it's a con game, Mr. Because Taylor. The, the sticks would be uh, yokels, and mm. the Morgans and Whitney's, they're posing as... Uh, no, the, the sticks are, uh, are not yokels. The sticks are, the, are also confidence men. Confidence men are setting a game for a dupe. The dupe is a Canadian, and the Confederates, who are sticks, are to pretend that they're wealthy themselves, Morgans and Whitney's, and their reward will be a hundred bucks apiece. What does suppose he sings mean, oh. Mr. Kieran? Well, that's easy. That means uh, turn state's evidence. Yes, uh, to go to the district attorney. And the other fellow says he wouldn't because the, uh, the gulls are looking for him back home, the police are looking for him back in Canada. Well, that gives us two out of three. And uh, so far, that means Lucky Strike has paid out two $50 defense bonds and two sets of the Encyclopedia Britannica. And now here's Mr. Cross, who, like Mr. Kieran, is given to supporting his statements with real authority. Well, ladies and gentlemen, perhaps you've noticed that when we say lucky strike means fine tobacco, we don't just let it go at that. We bring you actual market reports which prove that the makers of Luckies consistently pay the price to get the milder, better tasting tobacco. For example, here's a report that's typical. At auctions in South Boston, Virginia this season, the American Tobacco Company paid 29% more for the tobacco it bought for its cigarettes and other tobacco products. Yes, 29% above the average market price published by the United States Department of Agriculture. And the best tobacco we buy goes into Lucky's. Yes, smokers, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. That's a fact worth remembering and worth acting on because you know, if you stop to think of it, that in a cigarette, it's the tobacco that counts. Mr. Fadiman, have I shown reason enough for making the next package luckies? Mr. Croft, you've given us both facts and figures in just 57 seconds. Mr. Wilcott, coming up in the cab tonight, you were telling me that uh, 
When you were over in England, you were on an information, please, too. Is it any different from the way in which we run our little game here? Oh, it's much pleasanter, yes. It's much pleasanter over there? <laughs> you mean the questions are easier? Well, mm. we first get lunch. Mm. And uh, then you don't have to know pleasant. anything to answer the question. <laughs> well, are the questions similar to the ones we asked? Oh, no, here? they don't ask questions of fact. They ask questions of opinion. The first question I asked me was, um, Julian Huxley was on and Enid Bagnold and Professor Jode. And the first question was, what do you think of the future of the horse? <laughs> <laughs> And my next, the next question was, what did I think of the influence of parents on children? I... Uh, did they ask that of you, Mr. Wilson? Yes. And I suppose you oh, was very good. sound. You mean a half-hour program? <laughs> 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 Mr. Kieran, how would you like to be on a program like that? It'd be too difficult for me. It'd be very difficult. <clears throat> We're used to exact facts. We have no opinions about anything up here, Mr. Wilcott, you see. You depress me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see what you can do with this. Maybe I can depress you even further with a question from Carrie M. Burlingham of Denver. Name a child of literature or the theater who lived on a farm. H.I. Mr. Wilcott. Rebecca. Rebecca, yes. Of Sunnybrook Farm yes, by Kate Douglas Wiggin. Yes, we want to get our Rebecca straight. It's not the, the other Rebecca. Who is the other Rebecca? West. We uh, no, no, I don't mean that one at all. <laughs> du Maurier's Rebecca. Oh, you mean Daphne du Maurier? Daphne du Maurier. Oh, yes. I wouldn't discuss it. Didn't live on a farm. <laughs> How about a child uh, who lived in a workhouse? Oh, workers, as I imagine they call it uh, over in England, Mr. Wilcott? Oliver Twist. Oliver Twist, quite right. And one who lived in an Indian army camp. Uh, Mr. Wilcott. Wee Willie Winky. Yes, three out of three, Mr. Wilcott. <clears throat> three out of three, very good. <laughs> Do you like this better than you uh, like the English program now? Well, I like to talk about a horse. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a chance. We might get to the horse before the evening is over. Here's one from Miss Clara Deasy of Cincinnati. Uh, Mr. Kahn, our studio pianist, is going to play three compositions. Now, each of these is written in imitation of the style of another. Mr. Wilcott, come back to your microphone. You have to answer these questions, too. <laughs> I want you to identify the composition and the composer who is being imitated or who is suggested by the composition that you're going to hear played. Am I thoroughly unclear? Suppose it's a bad imitation. Even so. Even so. You have to name it. All, All right. right. Let's have the first. Get two out of three. <laughs> Mr. Taylor had his hand up at once. Chopin. Is being imitated. Yes. yes. Who's doing the imitation? Who's doing the imitation? Mm -hmm. The pianist. Ah. <laughs> uh, yes, and a very good one, shall yes. we say. But who is the uh, composer of the piece that's being played? Oh, I was so eager to get out Chopin, I didn't let the... Didn't, You're quite right. Now, do you want to hear piece. a few more bars of it? I'd mm. love to. All right. Uh, Mr. Kahn, would you give us a few more bars? Taylor has given us the right answer. Chopin is the one who is being imitated, and Schumann is the author of the imitation. Believe it or not, I was going to say Schumann. <laughs> well, believe it but or I not, I was, was going to say Schumann. I'll leave it to the audience. Uh, now the, the second one. <laughs> Mr. Wilcott had his hand Old up. Old Porter imitating Noel Coward. Very good, yes. It's, uh, do you recognize what it comes from? I ought to know. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Wilcott's heard that once or twice in his life. It's from the man who came to dinner, of course, yes. And how, uh, how do you, uh, you think the imitation is as good as the original, Mr. Wilcott? Or would well, you I think it's a pastiche. I beg your pardon. <laughs> oh, 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 good. Baby. <laughs> We've never had that word on this show before. That's a pastiche. It's a kind of crayon, isn't That's it? That's very good. And now the third imitation. Back to you, Mr. Adams. I don't know. It seems to me that Bach is being imitated. Very good, Mr. Adams. That's quite right. Uh, isn't it by the author of the uh, the music goes round and round? Oh no. no! I hope Mr. Templeton doesn't hear you say that. Oh. Alec Templeton Alec is Templeton? the author of it. It's Bach goes to town, uh, and the it's an imitation. It's a variation on a Bach fugue. And do you feel pretty proud of now, yourself, wait a Mr. Minute. Adams? No, no, no I hear wait, it very uh, the uh, the uh, the protest here. All right, go ahead. The protest. ground rules. You mean that Alec Templeton mm -hmm. is imitating Bach? Sure, he's taking but a Alec Bach Alec Templeton and... is not a well-known composer. He's a pianist, and a beautiful one. Yes, but he, he does... Uh... Yes, but these others were composers imitating other composers. Well, if he composed this piece, he's a composer, isn't not he? Not if I don't recognize his style, he's not a composer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a funny standard to set, to set up. I think you're just sore because Mr. Adams got the right answer. Certainly. No, he's right. 
<laughs> that gives us three out of three on that. But Wolcott could imitate Adam. I mean, uh, could uh, imitate Adams, for instance. Wolcott could? Yes. Again? <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, back to business. Here's one from Mrs. Victor L. Sherman of uh, Glen Ellen, Illinois. In what book or movie do these sporting events occur at important points in the story? The first is a race between fishing schooners. In what uh, book or movie, in this case both, does that occur, uh, Mr. Adams? Captain's Courageous. Captain's Courageous, yes. Now, how about a cricket match? Where do you find a cricket match appearing, Mr. Kieran? Find a cricket match in uh, Pickwick Papers. You sure do? Oh, yes. Uh, yes, I, I, it doesn't... Uh, appear at an important point in the story. It Every point is story. important in Pickwick Papers. <laughs> That's oh. very patriotic. Tom Brown and Rugby. Uh, there probably is a cricket That's match. It's a football game. Uh, oh, they play cricket. I think the one that most of us would think of, however, is Goodbye, Mr. Chips. No, Mr. Wilcox, isn't there a cricket match in Goodbye, Mr. Chips? I don't recall, and not particularly. Uh, I do recall it from Pickwick, but I don't I, I recall assume it from it Pickwick. I've never read Goodbye, Mr. Mm. Chips. You haven't? Mm. No. Any good? <laughs> You haven't read Gone with the Wind either, but you've been no. taking cracks at it. Well, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> it's much easier to make cracks about books you haven't read, Mr. Wilcott. How about field hockey? Field hockey, uh, in what novel? Oh, perhaps uh, 20 years or so ago, uh, do you find field hockey appearing at an important point in the story? Mr. Brittling sees it through. Uh, as the war begins, Mr. Brittling is playing field hockey. Well, I think I'll have to call that wrong. The answer I really want was goodbye, Mr. Chips, and send a $50 defense bond to Mrs. Sherman, plus a Britannica. Uh, how about this one from Bill Ritter of Detroit? Why are these names important in the history of newspapers? The first name is Matthew Brady. In the history of journalism, uh, Mr. Wilcox. He's the photographer of the Civil War. Yes, the first news photographer, we might say. He photographed the Civil War. How about Lord Northcliffe? Uh, Mr. Adams. I think he uh, issued the first tabloid uh, of the time. Yes, uh, the first illustrated, uh, the first illustrated tabloid. What was it called? Do you remember? The Daily Mirror. And how far back uh, did that go? We tend to think of the tabloid as a relatively modern invention, Mr. Kieran. Oh well, uh, it was in England uh, in the war, before the war. Oh, long before it. Yes, uh, long before the first. Then before the first war. Yes, it was, it was, the Daily Mirror was in New York in. Uh, London as long ago as 1908 and probably before. Just before, that about 1903. So you see it has a long heritage. Wasn't he the man who said that he'd founded one of his papers for people who couldn't think and the Daily Mirror for people who couldn't read? <laughs> that might have well, been he. It, it sounds did. very much like Northcliffe. How about R.C. Outcold? Why is uh, Mr. Wilcott? Well, the first comic strip. Yes, the first comic oh, strip. Oh, the Yellow Kid. Uh, was it Hogan's Alley or the Yellow, yellow Kid? The Yellow Kid. The Yellow Kid. Uh, when? About. 93, Well, in the 92. 90s, uh, in the 90s, surely. So that goes back a long way, too. Now, how about this one from Edith Kingsley of Cheshire, Connecticut? These are the authors of some great American classics. Uh, what are the classics? The first author is Timothy Shea Arthur. What classic did he write? Timothy Shea Arthur, Mr. Adams. T.S. Arthur, he was known as, and uh, the classic eludes me. <laughs> uh, I, I, you, <laughs> I can answer those. Well, I'll tell I you, can he, he can make more out of an answer like that than most people <laughs> can. <laughs> you can go wide up for a strikeout. I <laughs> you know it as well as you do the nose on your face, which is going some, Mr. Adams. Uh, ten nights in a bar room. Ten nights in a bar room. How about Ernest Lawrence Thayer? What did he write? Uh, Mr. Kieran. Casey at the bat. Yes, what were you going to say, Mr. Adams? Casey at the bat. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> And Gilbert Patton, Gilbert Patton, Mr. Adams. Uh, Gilbert Patton was Bert L. Standish. He wrote under Bert L. Standish and wrote Nick Carter. Ye well, no, I don't think he wrote Nick uh, Carter's stories. Frank Merriwell. Frank Merriwell, the Frank, very famous Frank Merriwell stories. That gives us two out of three. Now, how about this one from Ensign uh, William W. White of Minneapolis? I'm going to give you the given names of some famous people who all happen to have the same last name. I want you to give me the last name. For example, Edgar Henry and Lou would all have as last as the last name what? Hoover. No, 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 <laughs> Mr. Adams. Wallace. Edgar Wallace, Henry Wallace, and Lou Wallace. Is that all clear, Mr. Adams? Now, how about this? Charles Phelps and Robert Alfonso have the same last name, Mr. Adams. Taft. Yes, they're the sons of uh, William Howard Taft. Uh, Stephen Vincent and William Rose, uh, Mr. Taylor. Benet. Yes. And Horatio, Donald, and Byron. All had the last sa uh, same last name. Horatio, comma, Donald, comma, and Byron. It isn't Mr. Doc. Alger. No. <laughs> Donald Alger and Byron Alger. Must I think have been. 
And, oh, gentlemen, you should get this one. It's a name that's been in the public prints recently, and it's Nelson. Nelson. Yes, of course, Mr. Adams. I don't think I'm going to give you credit for it. No, I don't. No, I don't think so. However, we got two out of three on that. Horatio Nelson, Donald M. Nelson, of course, and uh, Byron Nelson, who, Mr. Kieran, is... Champion golfer. He's a champion golfer. That didn't come to your mind as I uh, read these three names. No, I was thinking of Byron. Uh, You mean George Gordon? That's right. No, Lord Byron. No, that's the wrong one. Well, that gives us two out of three. And uh, now here's Mr. Cross, who says he wishes you could go down south and talk to a few independent tobacco experts in person. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I know you'd be impressed by the genuine enthusiasm of these experts for fine tobacco. They're constantly talking about its ripeness, mellowness, body, and texture. For make no mistake, they know, as you do, if you stop to think of it, that in a cigarette, it's the tobacco that counts. And the qualities experts look for in buying, selling, and handling the leaf are the very qualities that give you mildness and better taste. Now, these experts know that Lucky Strike means fine tobacco because at market after market, they see us pay the price to get the better quality leaf. For example, this season at auctions in Kinston, North Carolina, the American Tobacco Company paid 25% above the average market price published by the United States Department of Agriculture. At Mullins, South Carolina, 34% more, and so on all over the South. No wonder that with independent experts, with men who know tobacco best, it's Lucky's two to one. Why not make your next package Lucky Strike and see if you don't confirm their judgment. Thank you, Mr. Cross. This evening, Lucky Strike has cheerfully paid out three $50 defense bonds, and that means three sets of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Thank you, Mr. Taylor, for joining Lucky Strike's party tonight. And thank you, Mr. Wilcott. Mr. Wilcott, if you ever get back to England and go on that information, please show again. Give our English cousins our best, will you? Oh, yes. Such as it is. Uh, <laughs> next week, uh, Oscar Levant, John Kieran, and Franklin P. Adams will be on deck, and our guest will be Janet Flanner, a journalist, author of An American in Paris, and member of the staff of the New Yorker magazine. Remember, listeners, for every question that's answered correctly, the sender gets $10 in defense stamps. And for every question that stumps our board, you get a total of a $50 defense bond. And in addition, the complete 24-volume set of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Remember to send your letters with questions and the correct answers to information, please, at 480 Lexington Avenue, New York City. And now, a parting message from Mr. L.A. Speed Riggs, famous tobacco auctioneer from Goldsboro, North Carolina. When you hear that chant, ladies and gentlemen, remember these two important facts. That at market after market, we pay the price to get the milder, better-tasting tobaccos. And that with independent experts, with men who know tobacco best, it's Lucky's two to one. Yes, in a cigarette, it's the tobacco that counts, and Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. But see for yourself. Next time, ask for Lucky Strike. This is the National Broadcasting Company.